Uh, this is the website that gave rise to this talk. Has anybody seen it at all? Um, yeah, it's not particularly popular. It gets about 300 page views a day. Um, the slide deck for this talk is available there if anyone wants to download it. Um, this is me. Um, I am a retired computer nerd. So for those of you techies out there, I am your future. <laughs> I am what your future looks like. Um, being retired means I can criticize anything, and I will, because I have no skin in the game. And it also means that if I praise anything, I have no relationship to it. I am not selling anything. Um, I've been focused on defensive computing for a long time. I blogged about it for one year with CNET and for nine years at Computer World. Uh, it's a topic I come to naturally. I'm a pessimist, and that's really the big requirement. Uh, the, website, the website is intended for non-techies, but I trust me, your techies here will not be bored. Um, also, I need a lot of feedback from techies because nobody knows everything. Here's today's topics. We're not going to get through the stuff at the end. I have 212 slides and 45 minutes. I will be talking very fast and skipping some stuff. But again, the slide deck, if you want it, defensivecomputingchecklist.com. So why am I here? Um, the big reason is that the tech press fails non-techies. And as a retired person, I feel for the non-techies. Um, the vast majority of the tech press are what I call art history majors. And I mean that as not so much as an insult, but I mean it as unqualified to cover technology. Not that everyone knows everything. OK, here's one example of this. Molly White, somewhat famous, um, big f critic of crypto. There was an article March 2022, this year, the New York Times. She hated the article. She hated it so much, felt that it was absolutely terrible. She got a whole bunch of her friends together. And look at this, paragraph by paragraph, they rebutted this article in the New York Times, basically saying that the reporter had no idea what he was talking about. Um, and that's, it's really a shame. The, the tech press fails us over and over again. This is an example of mine from 2017. Um, this woman is a business reporter for NBC, and I saw her on the news, and she said, oh, if you install this web browser extension, you can save 50 cents every time you buy toothpaste. It'll find you great coupons. Well, here's the web browser extension she suggested that you install. As you can see, it can read and change all your data on all your websites. Jesus Christ. <laughs> to save 25 cents when you're buying toothpaste? Really, that's what I meant here. You don't take computer advice from a business reporter any more than you would trust me when it's time to buy a gold ETF. Um, so there is some rare good news. A lot of this is bad news. Here's some good news. This is some drugstore. I don't know where it is. Um, zooming in, trying to warn people about gift card scams. Some good news. OK, if you, part of defensive computing is privacy. If you're seriously into privacy, and by that I mean if you're a member of the Supreme Court and you don't want people firebombing your house, Michael Basil is the kind of guy you would go to. He has a website, he has a podcast, he just started a magazine, far more into secure privacy than I am. This is just a heads up for anyone who really cares about privacy. Uh, a couple things, I do listen to his podcast. Um, I had no idea you could use Apple devices without an Apple ID. Um, he did a whole podcast about how Mac OS spies on you and all the domains he uses firewall to block. Um, professional grade router, always connected to a VPN. Of course, none of his clients can use either Android or iOS. He likes graphene OS. Um, he's not really a techie, so his VPN recommendations are kind of arguable. But just a heads up. Now, the flip side of extreme privacy is extreme openness. So why would you put on your phones your most important information, the most private information? Well, here you go, iPhone medical emergency. I know probably a lot of you are young, you'll never have a medical emergency for another 40 years. Um, does anybody do this? Anybody with an iPhone have put a med med medical stuff? Yeah, no, very few. <laughs> um, you know, if you fall over, you're unconscious. This could be really important. Uh, the point is that anyone who gets your phone can find this information without knowing any passwords at all. And of course, Android has the exact same thing. 
I have a note to myself that I got to put my blood type in there. I'm an Android person. Um, so here, yeah, you're making like, if, if you're married, you put your spouse's name and phone number there. You're making some information brutally public, and for many of us, it's the right thing to do. Um, here's another thing, the Apple lock screen, the Android lock screen. This is my phone. I will show you, well, I can't show you. It's, but does anybody use the Android lock screen, put a message on the bottom of it? Uh, where am I? I'm timing myself so I don't go over. It, it says on the very bottom right-hand corner, if found, email so-and-so. That email address is automatically forwarded to my wife and to myself. So if I lose my phone, I have some chance, if an honest person finds it, that they can email me, even though they can't unlock the phone. Am I the only person here that do, does this? Uh, one, oh, it's a big room. It's hard for me to scan. All right, there's about five or six people that do it. Always remember, and this is what the tech press never, ever says. Always remember. This is for the non-techies. I know the techies out there are going to say you can figure out who sent you an email message. Um, I have no idea who to fi how to figure out who really sent a text message. And certainly when you get a phone call, there's no chance in hell of figuring out who's really calling. So, I, I mean, I wanted to plaster this on the walls here, but opted not to. Um, tech press. This looks good. Planned Parenthood, website spies on you. Okay, well, thank you very much. But this is what the article is. This article is things are bad, things are bad. How about some defensive stuff? What can we do to prevent nothing? Absolutely nothing. So for the non-techies out there, there is black light, which is not really wrong black light. This black light is from the markup and is a great free tool that you can use to evaluate a website and see just how much spying is going on there. Um, here's is their report for Planned Parenthood. This is miserable. <laughs> this is absolutely miserable. I mean, the CIA must be jealous of all the spying going on at Planned Parenthood. The brutal details, I'll skip. Hope.net, by the way, got a perfect score from Blacklight. All my websites get a perfect score too. No spying going on at all. Um, you have no idea who really sent an email message. Again, I can't stress this enough for the non-techies. Um, there's no equivalent of a postmark. But about email, the most important thing is that it's very easy to forge the from address of an email message. Very easy. The other things are, of course, you can play with domain name games in the from address. We're going to talk, if we get to it, domain names at the very end. Of course, the sender's account could be hacked, and it could be from a business partner. This was a story, um, a company called 2U was teaching courses, and they were pretending to be the University of Oregon. They were a business partner. Basically, the University of Oregon said it was them, and they got a kickback from 2U. The, my point here is that people who signed up for this, they got emails from the University of Oregon. They thought they were dealing with the University of Oregon. But they weren't. They were dealing with this 2U company, which was subcontracted out to make the classes. Um, there's another thing called email thread hijacking. I'm not going to go into it because of time. The point is never, please, never trust the, an email message. Um, Gmail, the worst thing about Gmail is it's free. Free means there's no tech support. Those of you who depend on Gmail, one day you could be in a lot of trouble. Email is worth paying for. I do. I pay for email. I am very, very happy that I do. Here's a bunch of providers, ProTime Mail. Um, anyone else have any suggestions for ones that aren't on this list? Um, I use one of them. I'm not going to say which one. Um, but yeah, I gladly pay. And let me tell you, there was one time when my email was screwed up and I thought I deleted stuff and I found out my vendor actually backs up all my deleted messages for 10 days. I said, I got my money's worth. Um, Gmail, a 8 billion people use Gmail. Has any of you ever backed up your Gmail address book? No, of course not. If you go to Gmail, that one person did. Congratulations. All right, if you go to gmail.com and you open a new tab, you go to contacts.google.com, you can back up your address book. Nothing like having, having it in your hand. All too typical. Another article in the tech press. All these websites submit stuff when you're filling in a form before you submit it. Okay, big deal. Um, USA Today, it was one of the companies mentioned. 
So you type your first name, you type your last name, and while you're typing your last name, they've already sucked up your first name. That's the point of the article. But again, no defense. No defense. Chicken little, the sky is falling. So that particular article actually was based on a paper. And lo and behold, that paper had some defenses in it. But the defenses didn't make it to the tech press. And here was one defense, don't use Chrome. <laughs> Are you ever going to see Ars Technica say not to use Chrome? Probably not. Here's another thing in the article. They, may, they actually named some of the websites that were doing this nefarious thing. The article never mentioned any websites that were doing this nefarious thing. And the actual paper listed all the spy little uh, trackers, I say spying, tracker websites. So if I know these are the things tracking me, what can I do about it? And that's where DNS is your best friend. Um, this is a long topic. Um, an introduction for the non-techies. Every device connected to the internet has a unique number. These numbers are IP addresses. I'm going to stick with IP version 4 to keep the concept simple. Um, and this matters because these numbers are what the world actually uses to communicate on the internet. Um, DNS is the system that translates names to numbers. You think you're going to hope.net, but you're not. You're going to 184.105.226, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really important. Don't take DNS from strangers. <laughs> That's funny, but true. Um, the boring stuff about DNS, yada, yada, yada. The interesting stuff about DNS, um, you know, I'm old, I'm retired, so I don't know if Jerry Seinfeld references still go over. Um, but DNS lets you be the master of your domain. Anyone watch Seinfeld in the 90s? Um, if you control DNS, you really control everything. Um, that, unfortunately, DNS is changing. Old DNS, which lives for many, many years and still is around, an amazingly well-designed system, but no security. Um, so the new DNS is secure, comes in two different flavors. DNS over HTTPS, DNS over TLS, uses different ports, yada, yada, yada. Just makes it more complicated when you want to take control of DNS. Uh, why care about new DNS? All right, I'll skip that. Um, a lot of you are saying, well, I use uBlock Origin in my web browser. I don't need to worry about DNS. That's blocking all the bad stuff for me. There's some pros and cons to that. You can read it. I don't need to repeat it. Um, what DNS are you using right now? There are quite a lot of websites that will tell you that. Um, these websites were created by VPN companies. You know, you think Android would be smart enough that if you set a timer, it wouldn't go to sleep, but no, it's not that smart. Okay, 32 minutes left. Um, feel free to visit that. Um, there's a whole list of VPN companies that provide what is your DNS sort of services. Um, I th my favorite is DNS leak test, which is from iVPN. Um, the source of your DNS is complicated, very complicated. I'm not the world's class expert on networking, but this is what I came up with. DNS could come from the router in multiple different ways. DNS can come from your device, operating system level, in multiple different ways. And of course, it can come from your web browser. That is a fairly new thing, that web browsers can specify their own DNS servers. It's only the new DNS. Everyone calls it secure DNS or encrypted DNS. It's the new one. Um, source of DNS, uh, yes. So you can have two separate web browsers on your computer and each one could be using different uh, DNS service for this name resolution, for the translation. Um, I'm a big fan of Peplink routers. Peplink routers can do DNS right here. And you see here I've taken a.atlovin.com and assigned it an IP address of zero. So no device that's on the network connected to this router is ever going to be able to load a.atlovin.com because the router is actually doing the DNS. But again, that's only old DNS. New DNS would bypass this. And for those of you who are techies, this is their host file, but on a land-wide basis. Uh, yeah, for those of you who are techies, this is Pi-hole, too. Um, in addition, uh, Peplink routers can control DNS generically. So a lot of people will type CM instead of COM, and that is globally blocked here in this router. Um, CN is China, RU is Russia, so anyone connected to this particular router will never load any web page 
that ends with .ru or .cn. DNS providers, I, I think all these DNS providers are reasonably trustworthy. The list is far from exhaustive. Um, the worst choice is the default choice. Um, here in this room, our default choice is Google and Cloudflare, I've been told. Um, my favorite is NextDNS. I have a list of DNS providers on my router security website. Um, yes, anyone who wants to spend a minute, although I'm going to be talking fast, um, you can go to dnsleaktest.com and see who's providing DNS here in this room. The, um, the NOC, which is Network Operations Center, they've done a little test for us. Here in this room, you can get to Yahoo, you can get to news.yahoo, you can get to everything at Yahoo except Yahoo Sports. They have blocked Yahoo Sports. If you try to bring up sports.yahoo.com in this room now, you should be blocked. However, that's an old DNS system. You can specify in your web browsers that you want to use new secure DNS. And if you do that, that should bypass whatever fudging is going on in the router. Um, Next DNS, my preferred provider. I think it's a great service. It's a free service up to a point, 20 bucks a year. They block ads and trackers by default. Extremely customizable. Um, and it, you also get multiple profiles. So you can assign one profile to each one of your different devices. Or if you have three devices, they can have two of them can have one profile, one can have another. If you have two web browsers on your computer, one web browser can use one DNX profile, another can use a different profile. Um, Next DNS integrates with everything in the world, as you have to when you're doing DNS, Android, iOS, Windows, etc. Um, it starts off with two block lists of bad stuff, bad stuff being ads and trackers. You can adjust the block list that NextDNS uses. You can also control websites. You see here, Facebook, it says remove. That's because Facebook is blocked at the time I made this screenshot. I don't even know what 9G AG is, but you have another level of blocking, customization, and you have a deny list. So no matter what the other lists are doing, Specific websites you don't want to load, you can just set them up to deny. Um, which one? Uh, you see here, CTLD, Windows Update. Yeah, try one Windows Update on the computer connected to this thing. Ha, 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 you're not going to get it. I blocked Windows Update. They also have an allow list for times when you're blocking bad things, but it blocks too much. So you can make exceptions. Allow list and block list. Totally customizable. Of course, they have stats. My favorite one here, graph.facebook.com, shove it Facebook, right? You're not getting in, no, not when I'm using NextDNS. If you're not sure what to block, NextDNS has logs. Optional, you can turn them on or off. You can retain them for a day, for a week, whatever. And you see here, this was, this is my phone. Jeez, Android, you'd think you'd stay awake. Um, it allowed it to go to api.lift.com, but because the red line on the left-hand side, it blocked it from going to app.measurement.com. Um, and despite that block, Lyft still works. Secure DNS on Android. Android wins when it comes to operating systems. If you want to do secure DNS, Android is the best. There is one setting in Android, system-wide, and that's it. That's it. The whole system uses that secure DNS setting. Um, here's how to configure a Chromebook. The other Google system, Chromebook also has a single system-wide setting for secure DNS. That applies if you have a Chromebook that's shared by multiple people, they all get that one system-wide setting. So Google wins here hands down. Um, secure DNS on iOS is a brutal mess. I'm not even going to talk about it. Uh, I'm not an iOS developer, but I believe each app on iOS can use their own DNS. Um, secure DNS in a web browser. This is how you set it now. In the old days, it used to be different. You used to have to provide a parameter when you started the thing up, but now it's built into the browsers. Uh, secure DNS in my router. And again, here we have arm wrestling going on. This Next DNS will be used if you're not doing anything else. But if you're connected to this, this router, 
and your web browser is configured to use a different secure DNS, the web browser DNS wins, and that's what's going on. And if you have a system that's connected to a VPN, that wins too. So this looks like it's system-wide. It's not really system-wide. It's very complicated. DNS can come from the router, can come from your operating system, can come from your web browser. DNS is your friend. This was a recent story about routers that were being hacked with malware. And notice here that the malware attempted to gather the public IP address by contacting these four websites. Well, if you're in control of DNS, you can block those four websites. And guess what? If it couldn't get an IP address, the malware would delete itself. DNS is your friend. Um, and this is just sad. <laughs> this is why I'm here to kind of correct this sort of stuff. Um, there is a DNS blocking tester. A lot of these DNS companies um, try to block ads and trackers. This is a free test how well they're doing. Um, this is ProtonVPN on iOS has something called NetShield. You can turn NetShield on or off. You can tell it just to block malware or you want to block malware ads and trackers. And uh, ProtonVPN got a score of 77, not the best. Um, don't need that. Here's another VPN provider, Winscribe. Their DNS system is called Robert. Um, it's very much like Next DNS, but it only applies when you're connected to their VPN. And you see, they got 100%. Very good. Um, the EFF also has a blocking tester if you're using DNS to block ads and trackers. Um, they don't call it that, but if you see there in the bottom, it does show you if you're blocking ads and trackers. Another DNS is your friend. Facebook receiving sensitive, I mean, if you ever use the MyChart system, I think that's what it's about. A number of the big hospitals here in New York City use MyChart, and they integrate with Facebook, and Facebook spies on what you're doing in the MyChart system. Um, so to the point of this article was that the Facebook pixel was bad. Bad, 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 bad. But the Facebook pixel is connect.facebook.net. And if you're in charge of DNS, you can block that. And you don't have to worry about the Facebook pixel. The sky is not falling. <clears throat> um, another article in the tech press. I tried to email this guy to tell him that you can block Facebook, but no response. OK, Chromebooks. A Chromebook cheat sheet. Um, I don't have to read everything here. I'm, t I'm tight on time. Chromebooks are the greatest thing since sliced bread. Uh, I say that because I'm retired. Uh, Chromebooks put a lot of nerds out of business because they just work. They don't need care and feeding. Um, why do I bring up Chromebooks? No viruses, no malware, no care and feeding. So for non-technical people, it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. Um, it's the Chrome OS is the newest system. It defends itself better than the older systems. And old systems, I mean Windows, Linux, and Mac OS, these are ancient systems. These were designed 30 years ago. I mean, I've been in the field 40 years, and I call these things ancient. Um, Chromebook, all files are encrypted all the time. Erasing files off an SSD. Really difficult thing to do on these ancient desktop operating systems. Nothing on a Chromebook. All files are encrypted all the time. You delete your Gmail account, everything's gone, never be recovered. You can power wash a Chromebook, everything's gone, never be recovered. It's the best way if you have sensitive files on an SSD, it's your friend. Um, full Chrome browser, not the limited Chrome you get on the mobile operating systems. Um, Nice thing about Chromebooks, it gets three personalities. You can use just the Chrome web browser if you're a non-techie. My family does this. Um, but if you're a little more techie, you can install Android apps. And if you're brutally techie, you can install Linux apps too. So it adjusts to the technical level of the user. Um, very sophisticated thing, Chrome OS. Two copies of the operating system. This is a big reason there's no care and feeding. This is something, of course, Mac OS will never get. And Microsoft couldn't even spell it. Uh, so the system in the background updates the copy of the operating system you are not using, and the next time the computer is rebooted, you run the new copy of the operating system. It's the only way to fly. Um, anyone here know of any other systems or software that work this way? Go ahead, what? Solaris Live Pack. Say it again? 
Solaris? Yeah. All right, I'm not familiar with it. Uh, by the way, the Chrome web browser, I believe, works this way. Yeah. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Us old people are hearing goes. I apologize. And you're wearing a mask, so we have two strikes against us. But this is a big reason. Um, I'm a fan of Peplink routers. Peplink routers do the exact same thing. Uh, they have two copies of the firmware. So you're running version 7. You want to try out version 8 for a day or two. Boot to version 8. You're not sure yet. You boot back to version 7. It's the only way to fly. It's the most sophisticated thing out there. And you'll never see this on any other operating systems, at least not yet. Um, well the, one, the one danger in a Chromebook, of course, is you can be scammed to install a browser extension, such as that Honey browser extension. That is the one flaw in a Chromebook ointment. <clears throat> oh, and Chromebooks tend to be cheap. This was from a week or two ago. It's not the best Chromebook in the world, but for $79, jeez. Um, oh, and Chrome OS Flex is just out of beta. You can, just like this is Google stealing from Linux, you can install a version of Chrome OS on a USB flash drive and take a desktop computer, even a Mac computer, and boot it to that flash drive, and you can run Chrome OS. It's a cut-down version of Chrome OS. It only has the Chrome web browser. It does not do Linux, does not do Android. But it's a great way to take an old computer and make it relevant. Ah, and let's talk guest mode. Chrome OS has a guest mode. Guest mode is a great thing. Like incognito in a web browser, it saves no browsing history, but guest mode is at the operating system level. Um, yes, you can think of it as incognito mode on steroids. When you enter guest mode on a Chromebook, it's, you start off with a clean slate. You have no bookmarks, you have no extensions, there's no browser history, there's no Android apps, there's no link to Google Drive, there's no save, you have a clean slate. While you're in guest mode, you can't even make a bookmark. You can't install an extension. The only thing you can do in guest mode is you can read and write to a USB flash drive. And of course, if you log into a website, they know who you are. When you exit guest mode, everything is thrown away. Everything is thrown away. That's why I mentioned the USB flash drive. If you want to save something, you have to save it to a USB flash drive. Um, Apple is soon going to release lockdown mode for iOS. The great thing about lockdown mode is they've taken out some features. Okay. Guest mode on a Chromebook goes far, far farther than lockdown mode. Um, so guest mode is great to let a child use a Chromebook. There's nothing they can do. They can't screw it up. Guest mode on a Chromebook the safest way to use Facebook. There's very little spying they can do on you. TikTok, I was just in the news for being spying on everything on a mobile operating system. So, okay, do it in a guest mode on a Chromebook. And, and for hope, whistleblowers. If you're a whistleblower, a Chromebook in guest mode is your best friend. Um, there's nothing to be had if your Chromebook is seized by the government. Whistleblowers, I suggest, use ProtonMail, WebMail, but you do it in a guest mode, it leaves no traces behind. Um, I think ProtonMail for non-techies, whistleblowers, is far, far better than Signal, Wicker Wire, all that sort of junk. Much, much easier to use, much more approachable for non-techies. It's just WebMail. Um, it's free, it's anonymous, right. You can open ProtonMail accounts anonymously. Um, it, it, it always annoys me that no news outlets say, oh, you have a tip for us, send it via this and that and there. Nobody supports ProtonMail. It's, I, I don't know why that is. Um, ProtonMail messages between two ProtonMail users are encrypted. Simple, easy, you couldn't get any simpler, easier, freer, or more anonymous. But exactly what's going on when you send between, from and to a ProtonMail user. The world can see the from address, the world can see the to address. The from address, not a big deal, you can open an account anonymously. The world can see the subject line and the world can see the name of any attached files. But the body of the message and the actual attached files, no one can see that. Even ProtonMails, they can't see that. I love this picture, by the way, the whistleblower with their 
dart on their back. Um, okay, what is the first thing you should do with a new USB flash drive? Yes, that's the second thing. The f say it again? Oh, you know, between the mask and your hearing, I I'm sorry. Stick it in the Chromebook in guest mode. That is the only safe thing to do with a USB flash drive. And yes, then format it. Okay, quick takes. That was a couple long topics. Now we're going to real quick, the lightning round, so to speak. Again, I can't repeat this enough for those of you who are non-techies. Um, framework laptops, if anyone's buying a laptop, nice thing about framework is they're modular. If you're interested in privacy, there's a little switch on the framework laptop. If you turn the camera off, it's off. It's off, 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 hardware-wise off. And the same thing for the microphone and the framework. There's a little switch on the top, turns them off, off, off. Um, you don't have enough USB ports. You can take the USB ports in and out. It's not cheap. I just mention it because if you're buying a, I've heard very good things about it. This particular review is from a trusted source. source. It's an extremely long review. Um, the only th bad thing about it, it only seems to support Windows 11. Support for Windows 10, kind of iffy. But if you're a Linux person, they definitely support three different Linux distros. If you're doing a Google search, it's certainly best not to be logged in. You see here on the top, when you're not logged into Google, there's a blue thing that says sign in. And when you are logged into Google on the bottom, you'll see your first initial in a circle. So yeah, Google can't spy on you if they don't know who you are. And they really don't like that. <laughs> um, please, please sign in. Please, please. Um, the point about this article is that iPhones, even when they're off, they're not off. Um, I think the article detailed two separate wireless systems, or maybe three, that are still running even when an iPhone is off. Certainly Bluetooth, I forget what the other one or two are. Um, but if you turn an iPhone off and you don't want to be tracked, you certainly want to disable the Find My feature. Amazon. If you got a phone call from Amazon, is it a scam? It turns out Amazon does call people. I was very surprised. I learned this about a month ago. I was really shocked, just so you know. Um, and if you see something on Amazon, Amazon that says it's choice, the only thing that means is that it's in stock. <clears throat> uh, for non-techies, a lot of it, people will say, hover the mouse over a link, and you'll see on the bottom where the link goes. That's a scam. Yeah, I'm no coding expert on this stuff, but in this example, it, it does not go to somegoodplace.com. Uh, I blogged in this particular blog two or three separate ways that that can be made to go somewhere you don't think it's going. So for non-techies, just realize that's useless. Having the mouse over the link does not tell you where you're going. Um, if you have a short link and you want to know where it's going, there are a number of websites that will expand the link for you. I'm being safe on public Wi-Fi, like in this very room. Um, a couple dull and boring things, of course. You never do your banking on it, of course. If you're on an I iPhone, turn off AirDrop. Don't ever use Windows. If you've ever evaluated the firewall in Windows, it's like Swiss cheese. Um, some interesting things, though. Um, evil twin networks. If I was a bad guy, I'd make... What's the network here? Something secure? Hope secure? You know, there's nothing to stop someone here with a little technical skill from making their own hope secure network and you'd log on to that. As far as I know, there's really no defense against that. Um, of course, you're on iOS. A recent thing in iOS is it tells you which apps are allowed to scan the local network. I forget if that was version 14 or 15 that came in. Um, use a Chromebook on a public Wi-Fi. And of course, when you're done, tell the devices to forget the network so you don't. But here's the good stuff. All discussions about VPNs focus on the internet, fully on the internet. The LAN is a very dangerous place. This picture here is actually from Hope at the uh, hotel. And big question is, do you trust all those people? Because you're sharing a network with all those people. There's an attribute of a Wi-Fi network known as layer level two isolation, 
or is it layer two isolation? I think I made a typo. Uh, it's layer two, sorry. Um, what this controls is whether you all can see each other. If you scan the local network, are you, are you going to see his computer and you see his computer? Um, I tested this a little while ago, and this is not being used here. So if you're connected to this network, realize that there are all these bad guys who are sharing the network with you. Um, I saw this at Lincoln Center. A few years ago, I spoke at some other conference, and they didn't have it enabled. So you have to take this upon yourself to protect the land side. And it turns out that a small number of VPNs actually have this option. Uh, if you're using MOVED, this is MOVED on Windows. You see local network sharing, turn it on or off. I actually tested that one. It works very well. Um, IVPN has it on a multiple operating systems. Although they give it different names, it's kind of annoying. Um, Winscribe has it. They call it allow land traffic. I'm not 100% sure it works on Winscribe. But again, it's not just you have to test the software. You have to test it on whatever operating system you're using. OVPN supports it. Proton VPN supports it, at least on some operating systems. Um, but if you're going to be on public Wi-Fi, it's certainly something you want from your VPN. And the other safe way to be on public Wi-Fi is to use a travel router. In this case, the router connects to the public Wi-Fi networks, and you connect to the router. The outside world, all they see is the router. They never see you at all. Um, in this picture, this is from a company called GLINet. I've never used one of their routers. They sell a lot of very small travel routers. Um, oh, is anybody doing this here? No, not enough defensive thinking here. <laughs> um, all right, this is what it looks like in a, in a Peplink router. They call the feature Wi-Fi is WAN, and you can tell the router to connect to the local Wi-Fi. Okay, quick takes two. How am I doing? Uh, seven minutes. All right, this is slide number 113. I got 200. Okay, um, iOS settings, no, you don't need that from me. That's everywhere. TikTok, no big deal. Just use a Chromebook in guest mode. Microsoft, don't use Windows. You don't need me to tell you that. Office software, LibreOffice versus Microsoft Office. It's hard to make a case for Microsoft Office. Um, this presentation was done with LibreOffice. Oh, yeah, and did I mention when you get a phone call, you never know who's calling. <laughs> I cannot repeat this enough, only because nobody else says this. Um, router security, I spoke on router security at Hope. 2014. Um, three classes of routers. The worst class is whatever your ISP gives you, because they really don't care about security at all. Then if you go to Best Buy and buy something from Netgear, okay, it's a step up. Um, but the real step up is a business or professional router. That's what I recommend. Um, these are all the fancy features. I don't have time to read them that you'll get in a higher end router. The big thing is outbound firewall rules. This was from a recent conference, B-Sides in Knoxville, and the guy was saying about, oh, these printers got hacked. Well, you know, if, if your router does outbound firewall rules, you can make a rule that says the printer can never phone home. So the printer does get hacked, uh, so what? It's a very big deal having outbound firewall rules. Router tips, rebooted every now and then. There is some router malware that gets installed but cannot survive a reboot. It can't hurt every now and then. Um, oh, this, <laughs> really, the best routers. Look at this. Security, we don't need no stinking security. This is how we judge. All we care about is speed and range. Meanwhile, on my website, I've got like 30 different security features to look for. But the wire cutter, they can't be bothered with any of them. Um, a big thing in evaluating a router is whether you need an account with the hardware vendor. If you don't need an account, that's a good thing. Is the router spying on you? A lot of them do. We'll see an article here in a second. Um, two companies that I recommend, they definitely do not spy on you. I verified that. Uh, Self-updating. Self-updating is great for non-techies. Certainly, techies don't need it. This is really interesting about routers spying on you. 
I like the quote about Eero. If you have an Eero router, the only way it's not going to spy on you is if you turn it off. Um, and even though this guy was running for CNET, he couldn't get D-Link to give him the time of day. I think that tells you everything you need to know about D-Link. Um, Peplink routers, I'm a big fan, but in the time, I will skip it. PCWRT router, um, highly recommended. It's 130 bucks. What's great about it is for that $130, you get VLANs, which you know, I'm running late, so I'm not going to explain VLANs. You get VLANs and VPN support. Um, VPN support includes WireGuard and OpenVPN and Ike version 2. Um, firmware updates are free forever. For 130 bucks, I would think this is a great thing for dedicated for VPN use. You've got your main router, fine, hook this one up, use the VPN connection in that. Um, all right, skip for time. Skip for time, passwords. How am I doing on time? Three minutes. Okay, there are, these are the five, I wrote a long blog about passwords, so that's the URL there. Five separate ways for dealing with passwords. I think these are probably the five most common. Um, every approach to dealing with passwords has its pros and cons. So anyone who gives you a suggestion, this is what you should do, and doesn't mention the downside of their favorite approach, you're dealing with a religious zealot. Um, even for a single person, chances are that multiple password approaches are the right thing to do. Um, your most important passwords, I would argue, don't belong in any computer ever, anywhere. Um, and what are your most important passwords? The obvious ones being email, financial, and Apple ID. Um, password manager software. My blog, I have 20 reasons why I don't like password manager software. Don't have time to get into it. I'll just leave it at fooey. And I'm going to suggest a formula. Um, someone in this very space last night said, don't use password formulas. But he was suggesting a hard formula. A hard formula is you give it an input, you know exactly what the output is. That's not what I'm suggesting here at all. Um, so for formulas, the soft formulas that I'm suggesting is that you treat the password as two separate halves, that there's a fixed portion and a variable portion. The fixed portion, if you use it over and over and over, you're never going to forget it. And the variable, por variable portion can be something that's for you very easy to remember. A uh, simple example, I own a whole bunch of ThinkPad laptops. They all have different passwords. They all start with tulips. Um, and then they have a model number. So if I walk up to my T480 ThinkPad, I know it's Tulips T480. Very simple little formula. Of course, it's only for a few. Here's a, if you're a New York Yankee fan, consider putting Babe Ruth at both ends of your password and then just have a variable thing in the middle. Um, if you're in the US and you pay your taxes to the IRS and the word bleeding comes to you when you think of the IRS, there's your password. Babe Bleeding Roof. You'll never forget the Babe Ruth part. That'll be burned into your brain very, very quickly. Um, you think of Amazon, you think of Jungle, there's your password. Babe Jungle Worth. No, this is a pretty long password uh, and pretty easy to remember. And you can even write down, you can say, my IRS password is bleeding. And even if someone sees that, they won't know what your password is because they don't know that Babe is in the beginning and Ruth is at the end. Um, Okay, more quick takes. Um, I have one minute left. Um, these companies no, you have can five five minutes if there's no time for Q and A. So yeah, I'll have no time for. I'll take questions afterwards. I can be here for another six hours. Five minutes. Um, these companies can read your files, and these companies can't. Um, I mentioned Backblaze; they're a major player. Um, the complicated thing, the thing with major players is they get complicated. Backblaze does support not being able to read your files, but they use multiple terms for it. Cookies. Cookies are annoying because when people talk about cookies, I never know what they're talking about. Um, cookies are one way that websites can store a file on your computer. Fine. But there's also other ways. There's also local storage. 
file system, cache storage, database storage. So when someone says cookies, are they only talking about cookies or are they also talking about file system storage and cache storage and all these other types? I never know. And chances are when people are talking about cookies, they don't know either. Oh, and by the way, <laughs> when you get a text message, you never know who sent it. Um, a second phone number. I, this is something I've done. I've been very happy with it. Um, I have a second phone number with a company called TextNow. I pay $3 a month for it. It's a Wi-Fi only phone number. So it's also an app. So I can store it on multiple devices. If I lose one device, it's no big deal. And if that device is offline, I'm not getting any phone calls. And if I do get a phone call when the device is offline, they take a message and then they email me that I, something's waiting for me. I mean, they take a voice message, an actual recording. Um, the EFF suggested a couple other companies. Uh, I've been happy with text now. I'm not suggesting it's the greatest thing in the world. But having, having a second sacrificial lamb phone number, uh, I've been very happy with it. It's like three days after I got this, I went to some museum in the wintertime and I had to check my coat. And to check my coat, they wanted my phone number. And I said, I made the right decision because I had a sacrificial phone number to give them. <clears throat> VPNs is a big topic. Uh, I've got a couple minutes. VPNs provide three things. Um, these are the three things. Uh, do you need a VPN? Okay. The big thing about VPNs I will skip to because I'm only down to a couple minutes. VPNs on iOS. VPNs on iOS, if you look at this screen, you'll see that two places it says you're connected to a VPN and two places you're not. Who the hell, who the hell came up with this? Really? Um, Stephen Wright, probably my favorite joke in the world. I had to get a new shadow. The old one wasn't doing what I was doing. Um, and I mention that because is your VPN doing what it's supposed to be doing? I recently looked at a VPN to see if it was doing what I was doing, which meant er is everything in the tunnel? And lo and behold, and this was on an iPad, lo and behold, I found that everything was not going through the tunnel. This was iOS 15.5, which I believe is the latest version. Um, it's buggy. iOS is buggy when it comes to VPNs. It leaks. Um, Proton VPN in March 2020, they wrote this article about VPNs leaking. And you know, March 2020, coronavirus, they kind of dropped it. They reported it to Apple. Apple kind of dropped it too. It never got fixed. So VPNs on iOS, I, I blogged about it here if you want the gory details. I've actually been in contact with Apple and whether they've tried to recreate it, none of my business. Is there, did they admit it's a bug? None of your business. Will they ever fix it? None of your business. Um, if you're using iOS, don't trust the VPN at all. It is buggy. And Oh, double VPNs. Um, quick thing about it. Uh, double VPN means running two VPNs at the same time on your computer. You start out with a normal VPN, which is at the operating system level, um, except on iOS where it doesn't work. And then you can add a VPN that runs as an extension in your web browser. This is offered by TunnelBear, offered by Windscribe. Um, the Opera desktop browser has VPN built into the browser itself. The Edge browser will soon have a VPN built into the browser itself. Um, and of course, the browser VPN provider should be different from the operator. This is really cool. Um, so your ISP, if you're running a VPN inside a VPN, so you have an operating system level VPN and a browser level VPN, your ISP only sees the operating system VPN. They can't see inside it. The company that's running your operating system VPN can see that you connect it to the VPN in your browser, but that's all they can see. Thanks. The company that's running the browser VPN, well, they can see what you're doing, right? Any VPN provider, if they're corrupt, they can see what you're doing. But that browser VPN provider doesn't know who you are. They know you're a customer of the operating system VPN. That's all they know about you. Okay, I'm so sorry, but this is all the time we have. Give Thank Michael you. Harwitz a big round of applause. 
the next talk the next talk will be the keynote from DAC 416 or Little Theater. Please make your way there. And, you know, if Michael has time, feel free. You'll find him at the rest of the conference. Thank you all. Enjoy. And remember, Hackers Got Talent tonight. Thanks. <laughs>